So let's summarize what we've covered in Unit 5. Unit 5 was on empirical power laws, how to recognize power laws when we see them in data, and how to estimate the best fit for those uh, potential power laws. Started by introducing the idea of a cumulative distribution function. Cumulative distri distribution function, CDF, usually a capital P, sometimes a capital F, almost always a capital letter, is a fraction of data that has a value of x or greater. And this is sometimes known as a complementary cumulative distribution function, um, since a more typical or another common definition for the cumulative distribution function is it's the fraction of data with a value of x or less. Um, and when doing inference, it's almost always easier to work with the cumulative distribution function than the distribution function itself, p of x. The cumulative distribution function, um, as we've seen and I'll show an example, is a non-increasing function. It can never increase. It can stay level or step down. And if x is power law distributed, with an exponent alpha, then the cumulative distribution function is also power law distributed with a different exponent, alpha minus one instead of alpha, and a different constant here. So um, an example, we can do a cumulative distribution function for the word frequencies from the novel Moby Dick. And here we see this typical sort of staircase step function downward. And if we do a log log plot of a cumulative distribution function uh, for a power law or something that's close to a power law, we see a nice linear behavior. Closely related, essentially the same thing, is this idea of a rank frequency plot. So um, to do that, you would sort the data and then plot it against its rank. So in this very simple example, suppose you have data points of 4, 6, 7, 11, and 18. I've sorted them, they're in increasing order, and then I list their ranks decreasing, and I would get a rank frequency plot. So four, sorry, four, five, six, four, and so on. And this turns out, if I divide it by five, to be exactly the cumulative distribution function um, for this data. So rank Frequency plots and CDFs are equivalent up to normalization, and it's a fast and efficient way to form a CDF. Um, they were originally introduced for word frequency, but they're used to plot all sorts of things that aren't frequencies, but they're still sometimes called rank frequency plots, which can be confusing. Also confusing is that sometimes the axes are reversed and ranks are plotted um, on the horizontal instead of vertical axis, which would lead to a slope that's the inverse of what you would get if you did a the way I've done it in this course. So be on your toes when looking at um, other rank frequency plots, because sometimes the um, axes are backwards compared to what we're used to. So then we talked about how to estimate alpha. Given a set of data that we believe to be distributed according to a power law, what's the best way to estimate alpha? Well, doing what I've sort of hinted at before, making a log log plot, Finding the slope of the line using a least squares algorithm um, turns out to be unreliable. It can give very wrong answers. So instead, we are led to the maximum likelihood estimator. So maximum likelihood estimators, very general idea. Given a set of data and some distribution with a parameter, alpha, it can work for multiple parameters as well. How do we figure out the best alpha? Well, we form the likelihood function which is the probability of the data x given the parameter alpha. And for a set of data points, that would just be all of the product of all of these things. So L is the probability of the data given the parameter alpha. And what one does is one chooses alpha that maximizes L. You choose your alpha that makes the data that you observed the most likely. And that approach to um, estimation is known as maximum likelihood. So if you do that for alpha for a power law, you end up with this formula. And x min in this formula is the lower bound for the power law region. The formula here is for continuous x, 
and the formula for discrete x is different. It's, it's important to um, make sure you remember that distinction. And this and most everything else I discussed in this unit is written up in a really nice way in this paper by um, Aaron Closet, Cosmos Shalizi, and Mark Newman. Okay, so then I presented some results um, from that paper suggesting pretty strongly that the maximum likelihood estimator is the way to go. So for uh, identical synthetic data sets, all distributed with a power law or sampled from a power law, with an alpha of 2.5, um, only the maximum likelihood estimators, it's here in bold, produced results that were accurate. And the least squares sometimes produced really terrible results, 1.5 or 1.39, <clears throat> when we should be getting 2.5. Again, note that it's important to distinguish between discrete and continuous. They have different mathematical properties and different MLE formulas. So then there was this question, well, how would you estimate x min, the lower, uh, the sort of cutoff value, the lower limit for uh, power law behavior? And uh, here's the approach that, again, is in the Closet et al. paper. Try a series of possible x min values, your first data point, your second data point, and so on. For each potential x min value, estimate alpha using the MLE. What you then have is a model for your data. You're saying it's distributed according to a power law with an exponent of um, alpha hat. And some x min is the lower limit. So then you've got your data and you've got your model. Calculate the distance between those two. How far apart are they? And then use that as a criteria for selecting x min. In particular, choose the x min that leads to a model that minimizes the distance between the data and the model, that gets the data and the model as close as possible. For distance, there are um, multiple choices, I guess, but the most common one is the kolmogorov smirnov distance between the two cumulative distribution functions, the CDF for your model and the CDF um, for your data. So that's a procedure you can follow to ex estimate x min, and that's certainly much better than just making a plot and kind of guessing where x min should be. All right, so we know now how to estimate, we covered at that point how to estimate alpha and x min. So we know how to get the best values possible, but how good is the best? Maybe the best fit still isn't very good. So we need some measure of goodness of fit. It's very important in, in statistics and estimation. So the, we want to think about, well, how good a fit do we have any right to expect? Fitting to power laws is hard. There's a large range of values. Um, what, um, what sort of variance would we expect? So this leads to the idea of a p-value for goodness of fit. So we determine the distance d between data and our best fit model. So I've got an alpha hat and an x min hat that are the best we can do. So then we're going to generate synthetic data by sampling from our model. Then with that synthetic data, we again estimate alpha and x min. And it, it, won't be identical to this before because of statistical fluctuations. So then that alpha and x min for our synthetic data constitutes a model for the synthetic data. And so then we can say, all right, well, how close is the model uh, to the data, the synthetic data that we just calculated, that just generated? So again, we calculate the distance between the synthetic data and the model. And we do that again and again and again, 100 to 1,000 times. And that gives us a distribution of distances. And then we can use that to say, all right, well, what sort of range of distances would we expect? On average, how close should I be able to get to, a, uh, to, to fitting these values exactly? And so then we define the p-value as the fraction of di, the fraction of these distances that are greater than or equal to d, the distance we got with our original data and our original fit. So in this construction, a larger p-value is good in the sense that it provides more support for our hypothesis that it's a power law. A, in particular, a larger p-value means that it's less likely that the original fit uh, distance d, that we got that good a fit, is as a result of chance. 
So larger p-values imply a better fit, and thus stronger evidence in support of the idea that x is distributed according to a power law. And this is a, uh, just a very general remark that whenever you're fitting, you want not just to be able to figure out the, the best fit, but how good that best fit is. So goodness of fit measures are important. So then I mentioned that there are some distributions that um, are not power laws, but are easily mistaken for power laws because they're similar. And probably the most common of these is what's called a log normal distribution. And this arises if positive random variables are multiplied together. So um, the normal distribution arises when we add a bunch of stuff together. Log normal distributions arise when we multiply a bunch of random variables together. So when trying to establish that something is a power law, it's not enough to just say, oh, I fit to a power law and the fit's pretty good. Because maybe there are other distributions out there that are even better fits for the data. So what you want to do is consider some of those alternatives and see which is, works the best. So you would find your optimal parameters, your maximum likelihood estimators, for power law and whatever your alternate distributions are you're considering. And then you can estimate p-values for the alternatives um, and the power law as well. And if the p-values are low, then you can rule out those alternatives. If it's a, that would indicate it's a crummy fit. On the other hand, what if you get a case where both p-values are kind of high? What would you do then? Then you can calculate the likelihood ratio, calculate the likelihood of the data given um, your power law model and other models, and um, calculate the ratio, see which is larger. Um, the details for that, it can get a little bit involved, are again discussed in this paper by Closet, Shalizi, and Newman. And lastly, I close with some more general remarks. Does it really even matter if it's a power law? Sometimes uh, what's really of interest is establishing whether or not your data has a long tail. Long tail distributions are those that decay uh, more slowly than an exponential. And people often speak, or also speak of heavy tailed and fat tailed distributions. Um, I tend to think of them all long, fat, and heavy tailed as all being the same. I've seen some distinctions between them in the literature, but I'm not sure how standard those distinctions are. So in this unit, we've been looking at lots and lots of data analysis. Um, <clears throat> But it's important to step back and say, all right, what are we trying to answer about uh, this data? What are we trying to figure out anyway? Do we just want to establish that there's some scaling pattern, there's some sort of regularity? Um, or do we want to do something much more stronger, much, uh, a much stronger statement, and say that our data not just sort of looks like a power law or there's a bit of a power law trend, but actually is a power law? So this is a much harder thing to establish. And it, of course, we might want to use, we almost surely want to use, other information we have about the system. Is there a theory that predicts power law behavior? Um, if so, how strong is that theory? Is it based on first principles? Is it based on heuristics or, or, or guesses? Um, do we have a reason to predict power law, to expect power law behavior? Maybe we have a reason actually to not expect power law behavior. So again, all of this is to say is that the statistics is important, but the scientific context is important as well. So this brings us to the end of Unit 5. In the next unit, we'll look at different mechanisms for generating power laws. Where might power laws come from in the first place? And as was the case for fractals, we'll see that there are many different ways of genera generating power laws and similar distributions. So we'll see you next week.